Hey, sustainability champions, Daniel Hartz here. Did you know more than 10 million people die every year from air pollution? Today, I'm speaking with sustainability champion, Dr. Srikant Sola, the founder, CEO, and director at Devic Earth, who saw this horrifying challenge and decided to do something about it. Dr. Srikant founded Devic Earth, a green technology company offering scientifically tested solutions for environmental pollution back in 2018. Under his inspirational leadership, the company has touched millions of lives by providing them with cleaner air across more than 20 locations in India. He practiced cardiology at the Cleveland Clinic while widely reputed as one of the top institutions for cardiac surgery in the world for over 13 years. Dr. Sola is also a re recipient of numerous awards and has been named in the Who's Who in America, Who's Who in Science and Engineering, and one of America's best cardiologists by the Consumers Research Council. So we're speaking with an expert here, and I'm really looking forward to learning more about this solution. Dr. Sola, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me on your show. Of course, and where are you joining the live from? So I'm in our Hyderabad office in India. Fantastic. As we were just saying, it's uh, it's amazing how we can be so global uh, with such with this technology that we have available to us, and people can join in from anywhere in the world. Yes. So today, I'd like to cover three things, primarily, broadly speaking. No, number one is really the Pure Skies technology and how it works, which is how you're sure. solving this air pollution challenge. Then from there. The moment you realize this is what you wanted to do, and then what we can all do to be more environmentally friendly in our daily lives. So how does that sound? That sounds great. Thanks. Excellent. And for those of you who are watching this conversation live, please feel free to share your comments and questions for Dr. Sola in the chat. I'll, I'll be monitoring it and we'll be, I'll be doing my very best to make sure they get answered. So that's enough from me. And moving over to you, Dr. Sola, what exactly is Devic Earth and ultimately the Pure Skies technology. Sure. Uh, we're a green tech company. And what we do is we make standalone air pollution control equipment. What I mean by that is that this is um, sort of plug and play equipment that can be placed wherever uh, air quality is an issue. Um, as a physician, when I was seeing so many of my patients falling sick due to heart disease, I started to look for solutions to improve air quality across large areas. Um, as a cardiologist, I do a lot of work with MRI, MRI scans at the heart. And in MRI, you know what we do is we actually pulse radio waves. We send pulse radio waves into the body, and then that data, that uh, radio waves bounces back, comes back to the antenna that's put on the patient, and then we use that to make pictures of the heart, the brain, the knee, whatever it is that's, that needs to be understood and diagnosed. That same pulse radio waves uh, can be used in medicine for destroying tumors. Uh, it can be used for correcting electrical abnormalities in the heart. And as far back as 1990, 30 years ago, pulse radio waves was actually used to reduce pollution in water. Mm. It's, it's, so pulse radio waves, what we're doing for air pollution, is not a new thing. It's actually started in 90, 1990, where they started using pulse radio energy for water. And basically what happens is, whether it's the air or the water, um, I'll give you a practical example because we've all been through various lockdowns. Let's say that you don't wash your car or your motorbike for a couple of days. You go out after a while and you take a cloth or you wash it or clean it off. There's a layer of dust on it, right? Yes. So what happens is in nature, there are these dust particles, pollutant particles that have plus or minus positive or negative charges on them, just like the magnets we would play with when we were kids. Yeah, so what happens is they, they collide together. They're attracted by the charges, opposites attract. And because they're now larger in size due to gravity, they settle down to the ground on whatever surface is below them. It could be vegetation, it could be the trees, it could be the road or your car. Uh, the scientific name for this process is called dry deposition and it cleans about two thirds of, of all pollutants in the air. If it rains or snows, that's called the wet deposition because oh, it's getting out directly. So that's, these are the two ways that most pollutants are removed from there. That's, that's what nature has devised. What we do with pulsed radio waves is we speed this up. This pulsed radio energy, uh, it has to be pulsed in a very specific way. And that's the secret sauce 
of what we do. But when it when we do it just right, uh, it increases the amount of charges. And we've done a lot of laboratory studies, and this was recently shown at the Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur. The charges on these microscopic pollutant particles increase. So they're attracted faster and they settle out of the air faster and that improves air quality. Uh, what we do is slightly different. You know, earlier when we started this, back way back in 2008, we were initially working with um, frequencies uh, like uh, in the UHF range. Then we realized, man, you know, we need to make this as safe as possible. I'm a cardiologist and I've seen so many technologies and treatments come and go Mm -hmm. um, either because they didn't work as well or they weren't safe or they had side effects, you know, those kind of things. So what we did is we shifted to the Wi-Fi frequency, the same Wi-Fi that's in your router at home. Probably many of you are watching this at home or your office on your Wi-Fi network. We did the same thing. So actually we do pulse Wi-Fi. And the advantage with Wi-Fi is the hardware is, is inexpensive. <laughs> we know how to use it well. And you can link Wi-Fi units together. If you've ever been to, you know, the last time we were in airports, uh, <laughs> some, for some of us has been a long yeah. time. But, uh, uh, you know, in these large buildings or large areas, you can link Wi-Fi units together. The technical name is a point-to-point -point network. Mm -hmm. And you can then extend the range quite significantly. The largest Wi-Fi network in the world is 300 kilometers in Argentina. So these are really wow. big networks. And it's used to get internet to areas where it's not really accessible. So the advantage with this approach is we can reduce the microscopic pollutants, and it's fairly just the microscopic pollutants we can affect, but over large areas. And our largest installation to date is about a 750 acres. Wow, it's and so quite big. yeah, that, that's that's incredible. There, so the, okay, so we've we've covered quite a lot here. So. Um, so let's start with the, the microscopic particles part, because I think mm -hmm. that's um, that's ultimately what we're, that's the challenge that we're facing. Yes. Is, yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what exactly these microscopic particles are and, and why they're so unhealthy? Yeah. So if you look at it said the different types of pollutants that are in the air, you can broadly classify them to gaseous pollutants like nitrogen dioxide, carbon mm -hmm. dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and the particulate pollutants. This is what we call particulate matter or PM, PM for particulate matter, not for prime minister. And uh, they're, they're graded by their size. Um, 10 microns would be PM10, uh, two and a half microns in diameter would be PM2.5. To give you an idea of how big that is, mm -hmm. a PM2.5 is 40 times smaller than a, a the uh, human hair. So it's pretty wow. teeny tiny. We can't see it with our physical eyes, but they're so small that when we breathe them in, they travel down into our lungs. And especially the PM 2.5 is really small. It can actually pass right through the, the lungs into the bloodstream. And there it goes into the rest of the body. In the heart, you know, what I'm interested in causes heart attacks. Uh, in the brain, it causes stroke and Alzheimer's disease. In the kidneys, it causes kidney failure. In the pancreas, it causes diabetes. In the ovaries or testes, it causes infertility. So these pollutants are affecting all of us in many different ways. And it's critical that we first control uh, these pollutants. So the what is, what is the typical source um, where these pollutants are coming from? Right. The, if you look at, let's just take any country in the world, the 91% of the world breathes air that's not fit to breathe, air, where air quality exceeds the World Health Organization mandates for clean air. So it's everybody uh, who's watching this who is affected. Wow. Um, there's two main sources, right? One would be the, the natural sources of air pollution, the volcano explosion, uh, a forest fire. Uh, these are things that uh, happen. Uh, it could be the wind blowing across an uh, agricultural field and mm. causing the dust, or like across a desert, for example and causing dust storms. Those are, those are natural sources of air pollution. But what we're interested in, those are important. Think of the California wildfires that happen yes. every year. You know, it affects the health of millions of people on the west coast of the United States. But then there are the, the human-made sources of air pollution, which are equally important. And they're about one-fourth to maybe a third of that pollution comes from transportation, uh, both from vehicle emissions as well as resuspension when the of dust on the road when the road tires go over them. Uh, another portion comes from heavy industry. 
Uh, in some countries, uh, such as India, where I live, biomass burning is very important. We've heard of crop burning, uh, which happens in many countries throughout South Asia, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, even things like uh, solid waste, uh, burning of waste in open grounds, as opposed to proper uh, recycling, waste segregation, and uh, landfilling of waste. These are the common, and there are many others, common sources of air pollutants. So this is what we can control. And, you know, what we say is, you know, people ask me, what's the approach to air pollution that you take? And I say, well, shoot, I'm a doctor. You know, if a patient comes to me with diabetes, the first thing I'm going to do is, boss, you need to exercise, you need to lose weight, I need to get on a diabetic diet. Okay, these are the three things. And if that doesn't work, then I'm going to have to put you on medicines. And usually that's enough to scare them so that they'll start, you know, doing the right things. But if it doesn't work, then we have to use medicines. And the same approach is true with air pollution. The first approach to improving air quality, to getting rid of air pollution, is always going to be reduce pollution at the source, make your transport transportation less polluting, increase your renewable energy mix, uh, increase compliance with uh, air pollution norms for industries. All countries have great laws for minimizing pollution that comes from industry. The problem is in maintaining them over the long term and so on and so forth. When that's not enough, then technology can be an adjunct, but it's not the cure. The mm -hmm. cure will always be first reduce pollution at the source. And that's been our approach whenever we interact with the, any industry. It's easy for us to say, sure, let's go in and we'll bring your pollution down by 50, 60 percent. But when we're there, we say, OK, on our tour of your plant or your factory, we saw these 10 other things that you can do to also bring down pollution. And this will help you improve productivity for your employees, reduce the number of sick days, and it will actually make you more profitable in the long run. And everyone loves that. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I think it's a really interesting point. I mean, I, it's very important when I, I agree with you, I'll always start with the source. Otherwise, you, you're mm -hmm. basically just going to be fighting a never ending battle and um, there's no real end in sight um, it, it, unless you really a, a, a approach it from here's where this, the problem actually starts. Yes, yes. Um, it, it, so you, you're mentioning that you, you just said plant and factory. Uh, at the same time, as you're describing cars and transportation and rubber against the, the road and all of the particulate matter that comes from these sources, I'm thinking cities as well. And, mm -hmm. and if you're able, after you mentioned your point to point, you can cover, what was it, 700 or 750 acres? 750 acres easily. Yeah. Our largest Incredible. installation in Delhi was about 16 square kilometers, and that was quite successful. Wow. PM 2.5 came, came down by 60%, PM, 5, uh, PM 10 came down by 40%. So yes, it's really effective. Um, it's, it started with water and now it's moved to air. And it just, what makes the difference is how you use those, those radio waves. So just so we can, or at least so I can picture it. So 16 square kil kilometers. So how, how, what, what actually happens? You, you, you have a, a, a special machine. Yeah. So how does it actually so, work? So think of it like a big Wi-Fi router like a really big Wi-Fi router with a lot of high tech, you know, so we've got our IOT in there so we can talk to our machines. So sitting in Bangalore, right now I'm in Hyderabad, I can talk to all of my machines across the country. Um, it's got all of our antennas. We don't use the Wi-Fi antennas, you know, the whip antennas that are on your Wi-Fi routers. They don't work for this application. We have specialized antennas that are more um, appropriate for this particular use. And mm -hmm. then we have our, our hardware and software inside. Think of it as like a software enabled hardware. That's really what, what we do. And then we talk to our machines 24 by seven. Now, apart from that, and this is in a box that's maybe the size of a microwave that looks really pretty and really nice and sleek. It's like a test. We, we've tried to fuse um, art with technology. That's what cool. I keep telling our industrial designers. And give me something that looks like a Tesla, but it's standing still. So that's <laughs> what we try to do. Now, apart from that, we need to show the customer, you know what, air quality has improved. So we have a third party air pollution monitor, not our, ours, but um, from a, a reliable source that's been independently validated and certified for accuracy. And that's placed some distance away, mounted according to um, US EPA and Indian pollution control norms. And that data feeds to the customer via any app and so forth, but it also feeds back to our machines. And our uh, smart technology or AI inside the system will look and say, okay, this is the air quality of this site. 
but it'll also look at things we feed in. So we'll feed in things like, okay, if it's a factory or a city, how many shifts are they running per day? How many people are they? Uh, how many employees are there? Um, what's their production like? If it's an indoor factory where we're doing welding, we're going to ask them, you know, how many kilograms of welding wire are you using? Are you using manganese or using copper? Because it makes a difference. Uh, we'll go to Google Maps and pull out traffic density information. Uh, we'll look at many of our air quality monitors, if they're for outdoor use, have uh, meteorological data like temperature, wind speed, humidity, wind direction, which also affect pollution. And then we'll go around that customer site and we'll look at, but what are the other sources of pollution that could be affecting that site? Because, you know, many factories are in industrial zones, right, outside of cities, and they will have other factories around them. And if they may be doing a great job, but if somebody else outside of their factory is upwind and is polluting, sending mm -hmm. air pollution down towards them, it's going to affect their readings. And the next thing you know, they get a notice from the state pollution control board saying you're in violation, right? So we take a look at that. And then finally, we look at crop burning data from NASA to understand what's happening. So all this gets integrated and our system says, okay, today I'm going to send out pulse number X, Y, Z. And if the situation changes, I'll modify that. And so what happens is that smart tech is able to bring down pollution maybe by 30% in the first month or so, then by 50%. At, at most large installations, like we have a big steel plant uh, here in India, um, and that's running 70, 80% right now. We have another edible oil plant. I mean, the oils that you use for cooking, you know, the, mm -hmm. yeah, you wouldn't think, but actually they create a lot of pollution. I didn't know this wow. until we started working with them, but they create quite a bit of pollution and uh, their pollution levels have come down by 88%. So it's, it's hugely effective when applied with the right approach. That's incredible. So, so basically it sounds like there is, um, uh, well, you, you called it Internet of Things, but is there an element of machine learning? Essentially, you have. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, am I understanding correctly? Because this is this is a really incredible. Basically, you're, you're using a lot of da data from all sorts of a lot different of sources, yes. and de depending on basically the the day or really the minute or hour, um, you right. can understand what type of pollution is in the air, and based yes. on that pollution, you can send out the correct signals to target that type of pollution. Exactly, exactly. Now remember that, you know, that uh, no technology can do everything, right? I mean, yeah. that's not, a Tesla is great, but it's not going to take you to the moon, you know, unless no. you're on SpaceX. <laughs> but, and the same thing is true with pulsed radio technology. So what it does is it can clear pollutants that are smaller than 20 to 30 microns. Again, to put that in perspective, a grain of sand, beach sand, a really fine sand, is about 90 microns. So this is all, you know, microscopic, not visible to the naked eye kind of stuff that we're dealing with. But anything larger than that, it just doesn't get affected by the pulsed radio waves. So, for example, if you had a dust, dust storm, um, which happens in parts of the Middle East, uh, parts of South Asia, it wouldn't work. If you had a volcanic explosion, it wouldn't affect the, it would affect the PM10 and 2.5 within that, but it's not going to affect the visible dust that's settling everywhere. Same thing if you have a forest fire, it'll definitely affect the PM10 and 2.5, but it's not going to do anything for the visible dust. And that's really important. What's interesting is that it can affect certain gaseous pollutants. There are other pollutants that are gases, um, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide. And what happens is these are usually unstable gases. They often interact quickly with other types of compounds. Sometimes they become what we call secondary particulate matter, either in the form of aerosols or other complexes. And we affect them as that kind of, you know, as aerosols or secondary PM. So we're reducing them, but not to the same extent, maybe 20 to 30 percent or so. It's interesting to see we're able to produce carbon monoxide which is a toxic gas, which is produced when anything is burning and reduce that to the same extent. So that's really cool, you know, that we can handle these kind of gases and, and as well as uh, the, bad, the bad guys, the PM 2.5 and PM 10. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really incredible you, um, that, it's, that it's able to do. I, almost to a certain extent, I would think, um, I mean, you said that you can't affect everything, but at the same time, I would think that if there is a forest fire, if there is some sort of sandstorm, being able to mm -hmm. uh, reduce the most microscopic of the particulates is helpful anyway, since, right. as you right. said, it, it can be so harmful. Yeah. Now, remember, though, the way we're working is we're speeding up what's happening in nature. That mm -hmm. takes a while. 
So typically when we install a system, it can take a couple of days, even a week to see a difference in outdoor air because the air is always moving. There's always some wind being blown, even if we don't feel it. So it takes a while to speed that up. And when we're doing it very gently, we're not going, you know, we're not cranking anything up. We're doing it very, very slowly. And uh, so it's not to be used in emergency situations. Um, recently, for example, there was a, a plant explosion in one of the large cities in India. And unfortunately, there were several deaths uh, from that explosion. That was a gas explosion. Our technology would have no role in that kind of emergency uh, situation. So we're very clear where it can and cannot be used. Understood. Yeah, well, that's um, it's important to know your your limitations and your strengths. Exactly. Yes. Uh, and since you're sending out these, what sounds like radio waves or basically Wi-Fi, pulsed Wi-Fi, yes, pulsed Wi-Fi. Is there any sort of effect on human health or wildlife to have these kind of waves mm -hmm. being floating, you know, floating around? Sure, that's a great question. So, you know, people say, "Well, you started this in 2008." Then they say, "Doc." You didn't start Vedic Earth in 2018. How come you were so slow? <laughs> and I say, well, you know, as a doctor, well, first of all, I was working 10, 12 hours a day, six days a week. Uh, second is that we have to make sure it's effective, obviously. We have to make sure it's robust under different types of conditions, extreme heat, extreme cold, etc. Then we have to obviously make sure it's safe. And the advantage with the pulse Wi-Fi spectrum is that there are very clear rules uh, for every country on how much energy, et cetera, can be used with these, these types of radio systems. And as long as you follow that, then even the World Health Organization says that Wi-Fi is safe to use. We've also done our own internal uh, studies as well. Um, working in the hospital, I had our system underneath the cardiac surgery operating theater for many years <laughs> before David Earth was started. Um, and what we actually found uh, when I was doing this for the hospital, we looked at the number of people from the community who uh, were coming to the hospital to our acute care clinic or emergency room with, the, with uh, acute conditions like heart attack, stroke, blood loss to the lung, but also things like minor respiratory illnesses and so forth. And we saw that the number of all of these came down by some 30 plus percent. And this was about a year before David Ruth was started. And this was the real you know, kick in the pants, I said, oh my God, you know, here's something that is able to affect the lives of literally hundreds of thousands of people all at once and actually make them healthier. And uh, that's why David Earth was started. You know, it's air pollution kills uh, millions of lives every year. We're out to save at least a million of those lives each year. Well, that's, yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. And it's amazing because it's, it's preventative. It's all yes, about yes. making sure that people don't get to the point where they need to be saved. Exactly. Which they don't fall sick in the first place. Exactly. So, so you're actually seeing um, a difference in terms of the number of patients coming in due to air pollution related illnesses. Right. So in our initial studies, that's where we focused on. But then as we went into, you know, our customers are typically um, the heavy, we have two types of customers. One is heavy industries where they make pollution as part of their uh, process. So this would be the companies we'd expect, you know, steel, thermal power, cement, mines, and so forth. Also shipping ports, mm. airports have just started. But then there's another group of companies where they don't make any pollution, uh, but they don't want to be affected by it. So we've done a bunch of marathons where we you know, put in our uh, systems to improve air quality for the runners and the participants to improve their comfort during the race. A uh, bunch of hotels and schools. Uh, we're doing some hospitals now, uh, commercial real estate and so forth. And that's, that makes it really fun because we get to work with all sorts of people. But what we see is that air quality improves. Uh, and when air quality improves, we have actually seen, say, sick leaves improve by 11% year on year in many of these places, just because people are breathing cleaner. This is before the pandemic. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have, we take that data as our, as our baseline. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's cool to see how it's, how it's working and, and obviously air pollution, it's one of those things that we don't really think about breathing, you know, it just sort of happens. Yeah, and when it's you natural. Have, exactly. And when you have clean air, you don't really think about 
is this affecting me or is it, you know, you, it just, you just take it for granted. But when it does affect mm -hmm. you, uh, it becomes a really important uh, thing to think about clearly. And um, exactly. And yeah, if you're, if you're living in a polluted city, it, it must be very difficult to find a way out of that situation. Um, and so the fact that you're able to actually bring in a technology that can reduce that, especially in such a concentrated space, like for a marathon, which is very <laughs> cool. And you can sort of, sounds like you can map out, you know, here's where yeah, everyone's we running. Yeah, just take the roadmap and then place our systems along. And it's, it's a lot of fun. And some yeah. of our employees have even done the marathon as, as you know, as, they're, as we're there. So that's a lot of fun. That's very, very cool. You, you mentioned um, a little bit ago that um, the first couple days, nothing really happens. Then after a week, you start seeing uh, more and more. And after several or a few months, then that's really when you're seeing, you know, massive double digit percentages and right. decrease. How does, why is that, why does it take that time to actually get to uh, a point where it becomes more and more effective? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, there's a lot of natural variation in air pollution, not only during the course of the day. So in the morning, pollution is high. Uh, once the sun comes out, temperatures get warmer, then pollution levels go back down. Then in the evening after sunset, um, the temperatures start to cool, so pollution levels go back up. So there's these, these diurnal variations that happen. Mm -hmm. Then there are seasonal variations that happen. Um, say during the rainy season, you would have much less pollution. In the winter season, anywhere in the world, pollution levels will always be higher because of various climatic effects. So we have to be able to account for that. And if we know that the natural variation is say 15 or 20% per day, and we're just starting to get a 10% reduction in pollution, but the natural variation is 15 or 20%, to be able to say with confidence that yes, we have reduced it by X, you know, much more than that, we, it takes a bit of time. Uh, that's one reason. The second reason is, uh, we need to understand the customer. Uh, and in any business, understanding your customer is so key. We need to understand what's happening with their products, with their production. Mm -hmm. um, and we've really gotten down to really minute details. Like uh, if we see a spike in pollution for some reason, we'll call our, our customers. So we were in a hospital, for example, and uh, we were, you know, pollution levels came down with our system. Everything was great. Uh, but we saw that every day around 6.30 p.m., we would see a spike in pollution. And so we called them and said, hey, what's happening every day? We're seeing this. And it's a daily thing. And yes, the spike, the actual amount of the spike has come down, but we're still seeing this spike. And they said, well, every day after the, the, the clinics are done, we clean the, the clinics, we sweep and mop, so that sweeping kicks up dust. And then we go around and we use incense uh, to just provide some air freshening to the entire area. Um, because it was in a closed, crowded area. And that was what we were picking up. So we were really able to check on all of these, a lot of these details and understand why uh, the how of the air quality at that customer site. And our customers like that a lot because we know how they're doing in terms of output and productivity. That's incredible. I mean, that the sensitivity of the technology um, of those of those monitors to be able to capture the fact that oh, yeah. sweeping and incense. sweeping, uh, we can pick up cooking. You know, and when we're in homes, uh, we can pick up uh, when when people are cooking, and we know that, and we say, okay, people are cooking right now. Let's let's you know ignore that <laughs> that temporary spike. So Especially it, in India with all the Indian masalas and things. Yeah, the pollution goes swing like this. <laughs> Yeah, sounds delicious. Um, as far as uh, so, so the hospitals were sweeping indoors. So you, you mm -hmm. can also use the technology inside, not just for outside. Yes, yes. So we because our solution um, covers such a large area. I mean, the smallest, smallest, smallest we can get is like five, eight thousand square feet, and. I'm sure the same is in Bang is is in London as it is in Bangalore and Hyderabad, but we just don't have that many customers with homes of that size, you know. <laughs> so um, we we can use it for large homes, but mainly the focus is on the heavy industries where they have a lot of space or offices or cinema halls or or, or corporate offices where it makes sense to do these kind of things. We've even done a couple of public events like gatherings, and festivals, and things, and those are are great fun. Yeah, that's that's very cool. I th well, yeah, you mentioned marathons as well, and so so you you can use it inside of a factory or inside of a right. space right. of some sort as yes. well. Yeah, yeah. How, how does 
how does air pollution control normally work? I mean, is there any sort of, um, are there any other technologies or have there been technologies up to this sure. point that are sure. attempting? So if you're, let's say you're a factory, let's say you're an automobile major or you're um, making some kind of heavy equipment and you're doing welding, let's say. So here, what you're gonna do to control air pollution is you're gonna have local source um, treatments for pollution and there you'll use fume extractors. So these are like gigantic vacuum cleaners with a long pipe that you put right next to where you're doing the welding and they mm -hmm. suck out the fumes. So that's all source. But then some of those fumes are going to escape. You can't capture all the fumes and all the, the pollution in those you know, extraction type of devices. So you need something that's a facility-wide technology. And that's where Pure Skies works. It's meant for the entire facility. If you look at what's happening outdoors, let's say you're in a, a steel plant or um, a thermal power plant or a cement plant, there you have the traditional air pollution control equipment, which works really well. These are called electrostatic precipitators, and dust cyclones and bag houses, and they work great for capturing dust and, and scrubbers, for capturing gases and so forth. They're very costly mm -hmm. and uh, they can only uh, work on what's coming from the chimney called the flu stack. They don't capture anything that's outside in the air around them. On the other hand, this pulse rate wave technology, it doesn't work for what's in the chimney because that those gases, one, they're moving really fast, and two is they're really hot. So mm -hmm. that process of dry deposition that I told you earlier, that's what we speed up, that doesn't happen inside a chimney. So you need traditional air pollution control equipment inside the chimney, but once the dust and pollutants are released outside, you need something else. And that's where our system can be used to clean up what's around the environment. And this could be dust that's from the chimney, pollutants that come from the chimney. It could be even what we call fugitive emissions. And by fugitive, I don't mean like a bad guy. I, you know, I mean uh, pollutants that, are escape, that, are, that escape by accident. It could be um, as a heavy vehicle moves over the road, or during loading and unloading of, of raw materials for that process. And these are an important source of pollution that we can handle uh, efficiently mm -hmm. with this type of approach. I think that's, I think that's a really important point is, um, it, it sounds like you're not, um, you're, you're basically filling a, a portion of the airspace. Yeah, a gap, yes, exactly. Because yeah. clearly, I mean, you can capture, um, at least with industry, you can capture at the source, but um, what about as we were talking about, just pollution that comes from cars, lorries, trucks, et cetera, that yes, just occurs. Yeah, that's really important. So like when we do a marathon, for example, we'll typically place our uh, units on uh, the street light poles, the utility poles for streets or traffic signals and so forth. And then we might place, uh, we have a base station and extender units, just like a Wi-Fi network in your airport or hospital or shopping mall or hotel. So the same thing. And we'll place the base stations on a second or third third story of a building nearby uh, along the route. And that allows us to cover the air quality around that particular area. The same thing happens when we do public Wi-Fi networks, right? If you've been to a train station or bus station or airport where they have these, the, the routers are not like way up in the sky, you know, at the top of the, say, the tower, the, the air traffic control tower. They're at the ceiling level so that mm -hmm. they can broadcast where the users use them. And we, we do the same thing. Our, our external units are, are small, so they're not very um, unsightly. They're quite aesthetic. Well, make, well, and plus, if you're fusing art with technology, then they are hopefully not just unsightly, but actually quite nice looking. Very attractive, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, we're, and we're changing. I mean, it keeps improving. It's not that we're satisfied with what we have. I don't think we'll ever be. Um, but uh, we have a great team of industrial designers, a superb team of uh, engineers. Uh, I mean, wonderful scientists. Mar I mean, it's just, it's, it's so awesome when you have a great team, marketing, finance, operations, everybody. It just makes things uh, a lot of fun to be doing this kind of work. Absolutely. Uh, we actually have a question from uh, someone who's watching live. Mubashir Akhtar says, uh, Hi, Dr. Sola. Containing air pollution for a marathon must be challenging as the environment isn't enclosed. And we, we did mm -hmm. touch on this, but um, the question is, can you please point out the challenges and how you deal with them? Yes. So we limit the co coverage to the marathon area, plus anything that might be affecting the uh, 
uh, marathon area from upwind sources. So we, our en environmental engineers will track out what's the wind direction, what's the climate effect likely to be during this day. We start about a week in advance of the marathon, putting up our machines, getting everything ready, bringing down pollution, and then we really crank it up on the night and the morning of the marathon. Most marathons occur in the early morning, six o'clock or so, when air pollution is actually at its worst. So that actually you know, brings an additional challenge to us. Yeah, so early morning runners, uh, like me included, uh, you know, we're actually running probably at not the best time of the day. It's convenient, but that's when air quality is not so good. So we have to take into account this. Luckily, we don't have to uh, deal with traffic emissions or vehicle emissions because the roads are usually closed to traffic during most marathons. But we do have to take climatic conditions into account, and that's really critical for us. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I think uh, as we talked about really the just the way that the technology works as a Wi-Fi signal um, mm -hmm. and using the dry deposition, it doesn't actually matter that the environment is not enclosed. No, no, it's going to blow down wind. And what we've seen in, in cities like Delhi, where we have a lot of air quality monitors, for example, I mean, they've done a great job in, in measuring air quality across the city, is we can see that the once the wind, uh, the downwind areas from where we our systems are placed, if it's a large area, they actually receive the benefit from that. And so their air quality starts to get better because they're downwind. It lasts for maybe a few kilometers. It's not gonna be like the entire city 50 kilometers down is breathing cleaner, but for a few kilometers at least, they'll also have the benefit of that cleaner air as the air mass moves downwind. I know we're speaking about, I mean, microscopic particles here um, that are a, a fraction of the width of a human hair. But is it possible when, you know, after um, Pure Skies has been working in a city, let's say, for a couple months, is it possible to actually see the dry deposition happening? I mean, is it you know, dustier on cars, for instance, than it was mm -mm. before yeah. you started? We've actually done experiments with this in the lab setting where we've done electron microscope studies uh, to look at what happens. And what we see is that uh, the particles, once they settle in, you know, when we put it in our exposed chambers to this pulsed radio wave technology, we put electron microscope plates at the bottom and we examine them. The particles are very amorphous. They don't look like regular PM particles because they've sort of clumped together. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't see them coming back up, which is called resuspension. That's a good thing because that would be a problem, meaning the dust that comes back down, the comes that dust that comes down doesn't really go back up. That's a good thing. The advantage with this approach is, is one is the limitation of the size effect. We can't affect anything more than 20 or 30 microns. So we're limited to just the really PM10, PM2.5, the smaller the particle, the better. Our latest research uh, from the in Indian Institute of Technology shows that we're able to affect particles as small as coronavirus. And we're really excited about that. We're testing this at a virology lab now to see how well we can affect COVID. Um, but uh, we don't see a layer of dust with the system over long periods. And that's probably because um, the pollutants that we deal with are present in parts per million, you know, 20, 40, 50 parts per million, very dilute amount. And they're also microscopic to start with. Our customers who do, let's say, painting for um, automotive or uh, whatever, you know, industrial processes, you don't see any effect of the technology, say, on their painting, for example, which would be very important. We don't see it affecting agriculture or um, landscaping, for example. So gotcha. that's, that's good. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I suppose that that, that is an important aspect to consider mm -hmm. as well. You don't want yes. necessarily it to affect that yes. way. But the fact that it can affect, potentially affect viruses um, like COVID, uh, that would be a very exciting uh, breakthrough. I mean, even yes. hopefully COVID will be something that we will be remembering fondly uh, years from so. now. And that's, as, that's <laughs> not, and nothing more, but it could be fascinating if it can affect even like the flu somehow or you know, some of these other things. You know, we're a very data-driven company. There's a saying that I'm fond of telling my, my team is that in God we trust, but everyone else must have data. And <laughs> I really feel that I, I, I'm proud that, you know, we've been able to submit uh, scientific manuscripts to several peer-reviewed scientific journals and really happy that our technology has been 
verified by validated by third party labs and, and that we have so many real world case studies, but still there's so much to do um, because it is a new technology. The first the first work on pulse radio wave, I, I mentioned 1990 mm-hmm. for this use in water. And what happened is while it was very effective, it was meant to treat the pollutants that were coming from industries in their effluent treatment plants. And at that time, the the common usually ways use ways to get rid of those pollutants was expensive. And it worked great, but it was just too, it was too much uh, energy intensive to make it economically feasible. But with the advances in the technology, it's now become much cheaper. And in fact, our technology works great in water. We've done uh, early studies both in the field and the lab, which shows that we're able to reduce certain pollutants by about half in uh, water bodies. Again, which is very exciting, but we've got our hands full with the air. And once we get that settled, we'll come back to the water as well. Uh, and this actually is leading to one of my questions as far as future innovations that you're working on. Um, it, what would be a, a use case in terms of water? I mean, what would be the ideal water body uh, where this technology could be used? Sure. You know, unfortunately, uh, the world over, uh, some 10 to 20 percent only of water, wastewater gets treated in sewage treatment plants and the rest is just let into water bodies. That um, creates a high pollutant load in lakes and rivers, which then causes a process called eutrophication, which means Mm -hmm. that um, the nitrogen and other content gets so high. uh, We've all seen this, lakes where the water is green because Mm -hmm. of algae in the water, and then it chokes, it soaks up all the oxygen and it just chokes the life out of that water body. So this would be an application for that. So you just place this inside and then let it reduce the nitrogen uh, phosphate and sulfate content in the water so that the water can be balanced. Again, going back to the source is reducing the effluent, uh, you know, the raw waste flowing into the river or lake in the very beginning. Uh, but then there's still a, a role for this as as well. Yeah, well, I, think I think that's... What's, yeah, I mean, it's so important because without water, without air, these are the basic building blocks of life. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's uh, that's what's fascinating about about this technology that you're working on is you're really um, uh, you're really affecting the most basic elements of yes. you know, life, well, like you exactly. said, water and air. Yes. Um, you know, these are things that we really can't live with for uh, for a very long time. Um, we have a question from I mean asking about carbon. Um, So I'm imagining this question is related to more like carbon sequestration. Uh, Mm -hmm. Is there any way that this technology could, uh, you know, kind of like carbon capturing or um, that's how I'm choosing to interpret this? Sure, sure. So uh, our earlier lab studies have shown that we are able to reduce uh, ambient carbon dioxide. CO2 is one of the principal greenhouse gases. In the field, in indoors, we are able to see that uh, indoor CO2 reduces by about 20 to 40 ppm, which is quite a bit. Um, But what we've not understood, and our our research team is working hard on this, is exactly how does this happen? Mm. And uh, if you have ideas, we'd love to hear that we're actually setting up a new gas lab and working on this. But CO2 is a really stable compound. And, uh, you know, we can't break that, that, uh, that carbon and oxygen together. Uh, but what we have seen in the lab um, with electron microscope studies is that the carbon is precipitating down onto the bottom of the uh, testing chamber. So uh, stay tuned. I, I hope that we'll have this solved uh, shortly. Our team is really, really good, and, uh, and uh, we're just about to start work on this. Uh, so I hope that we can have an answer for this, but I guess I'll ask you to come back to me in a few months uh, for more. It's fa- uh, it's so cool that this one technology seems to have so many applications. I, and you started really just with reducing air pollution, and all of a sudden, right. there could be potential. Um, you know, it could affect viruses, which will will uh, reduce global pandemic, uh, hopefully, <laughs> um, and then potentially reducing CO two. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it seems like a, a very powerful technology that has a lot of use cases and you're really just getting started in terms of we're just getting started you know we're growing into um uh, the middle east and south asia this year uh by the end of this year we'll be in the u.s and the eu um just getting started it's really exciting to to see this happening and uh, looking forward to collaborating looking forward to working with uh, teams from across the world we're just uh, getting ready for an installation in chile at a mm-hmm. copper mine in, their, in that country, um, 
we've got other requests from around the world and we're just saying, wait, wait, we need <laughs> to, uh, you know, get all the small, small administrative things done and then we'll uh, get started. But it's, it's a really exciting time. That's fantastic. How, out of curiosity, how many installations do you have around the world? Right now, we've got 40 plus, and we expect to do about another easily 100 plus uh, this year. That's what I would expect. Yeah, there's, there's, been, there's been huge demand uh, from this uh, across industries. And again, that's just, it's so much fun to work with people who are, you know, these are industries like cement and steel and coal and mines. And we all think of them as the bad guys, but actually they're not. They really want to do things to improve air quality. They want to make, the, they want to produce. We need cement and steel to build our cities and our homes and buildings. Absolutely. And they want to make it better for everyone. And it's so much fun to be able to work with uh, the people at these organizations to, to really help them to do their work better. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a, a great joy for me. I think it's really important. I mean, you know, if we were to just remove these um, industries which which pollute, life would be very different and probably not nearly as good as it was. And so uh, mm -hmm. to partner with them and to work with them and to find solutions to these challenges, I think, is what we need to do rather than going backwards and saying, okay, well, we're never going to use cement again. I think it's right. all about evolving. How can we How can we take what we have now and make it better and make it um, make it work so that it doesn't yes. harm the environment, it doesn't harm people, um, and instead we're actually able to continue what we're doing now and even protect and heal the planet. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Mohammed. Um, should the government adopt the air detection and analysis project by Azure or IoT and show it by a screen in cities? Uh, and and have it link with a mobile app to show people mm -hmm. the pollution percentage so that uh, they avoid the areas which contains the highest areas of contamination or, or air pollution. Do you believe sure. that, that constant monitoring? So I'm a, I'm a runner. Let me give you an example. Uh, I'm a runner. And uh, before we had Pure Skies uh, you know, installed, I've got one unit in my house for my community and all that kind of stuff. Cool. Um, I would get out my running kit, put my running shoes, everything would be ready so that when I came home from the hospital, I would just change clothes and go running. But in the winter, when it's more polluted in, in big cities like Bangalore, I would start running and then I would just turn around because the air was just too dirty for me to run it. And it's not just cities in developing countries, it's Paris, it's London, it's Los Angeles, it's San Francisco, it's mm. uh, cities and countries around the world that are facing the same problems. So if you know the air quality where you live, you can use that data to help you to live better, um, whether you can avoid certain uh, act physical activities during certain times of the day, for example, like me with running, um, or whether you can take uh, things, uh, you know, action at home to protect yourself, putting in air purifiers, plants. There's a lot of debate on whether they really do help or not for improving air quality, but they certainly make you feel better. Um, but you can take those steps so that you can avoid at least the, the worst things that could harm your health through bad air quality. Yeah, I think that's an important point, especially probably when you're running mm -hmm. and really inhaling deeply and getting yes. all that. Yeah. And you're inhaling through your mouth, right, when you're running. So it bypasses the filtration system in your nose and upper um, part. So it goes straight into your lungs. So a lot of marathon runners uh, you'll see will have mild reduced uh, lung function uh, as well as more serious uh, amateurs will have a, a lot, my, light reduction in, in lung function because they've just been breathing pollution wow. for so long. Wow, that's uh, that's crazy. So um, so I guess, yeah, the answer to Mohammed's question is yes, very, very much so. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that, I mean, clearly it's um, it can affect you quite a lot. And so if you're able to avoid running during times when, um, or in areas specifically where there's mm -hmm. high pollution. Sure, yeah. sure. Or if you have a young babe and you want to go out for a walk with your baby, you know, that's not, and you know it's polluted, that's not the time to go out. Because remember that children and the elderly, they're the two that are most affected mm -hmm. by air pollution. They're the ones we need to protect the most. I've also heard that air pollution, um, or at least I think there were some studies showing that severe air pollution or probably not, it doesn't even have to be severe can affect a child's learning capabilities yes. and, and development. Yes, exactly. Test scores go down, um, athletic performance goes down. So it affects them uh, in, in many different ways, even short-term memory. 
so we joke with our, our clients, you know, our customers at industry saying, look, you know, next time your employee says that he or she forgot to do something, you know, maybe it's them, but maybe it's just the air quality. So, <laughs> yeah. so here's my business card. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, and the, um, the types of clients you have, are they all, um, industry related or private companies or are you actually are governments reaching out to your cities reaching out saying you know we need some assistance here yeah we've had a lot of cities and governments reach out to us lately and that's been really exciting so we're mm -hmm. working with those those are in the works uh we're in the monsoon season right now just the cusp of the the monsoon season so that'll take about three or four months to recede once that does and we, we expect these projects to go forward and Fantastic. you know our dream has always been to to save a million lives and that's now we're seeing that it will, will hopefully happen once these installations go up fantastic yeah, and then hopefully with each year um that number can keep going up and up exactly exactly yeah i'm thinking just like in uh, in london there's some you know some major hot spots oxford circus piccadilly circus just these areas of mm -hmm. high traffic lots of um cars just going in and out and um idling a lot and um if you yeah. can you know just kind of focus on these spots um, and just reduce in the pollution in those specific right. areas. Right. Um, I'm sure you could just, you know, pick your top five, top 10 areas. Exactly. And just start it's, there. It's a simple thing to create a pollution heat map for any city exactly, or yeah. town and say, okay, let's cover the train station, the bus station, the airport, uh, let's look at these uh, traffic junctions that are very crowded. And then that's the first stage. And then maybe the second stage you say, well, shoot, what about schools? Uh, what about hospitals? You know, can we create clean air zones around them as well? But that, you know, so you could actually take it uh, very far um, to provide clean air for those who need it the most. Yeah, I think that's, it's really important to be able to do that. And um, uh on a slightly different topic, are there any um, sustainability leaders that you admire or perhaps a book or a podcast or a TV show that you can re recommend something that informs the work that you're doing or sure. keeps you motivated? Well, apart from Daniel Hartz, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm so impressed by the numerous entrepreneurs I have seen over the years who um, are nameless, but they're just doing amazing projects, things that really speak to their heart because they feel it's important. You know, people who have started, uh, two young ladies uh, have started in our city a zero waste uh, grocery store. You can get all your daily needs with a minimal packaging waste. Uh, a small company has started um, uh, biogas uh, for uh, wet waste. So your vegetable and compost waste goes into a biogas container. The methane that's produced then gets uh, put into a gas cylinder, which then is used for cooking. So you can use it for energy. Others have done things like turning uh, banana leaves or arica leaves into uh, plates, disposable plates, that once you're done with after your party or event are tossed into the compost bin, shredded, and then tossed in the compost bin to become compost again. And there's so many such people and, and really my hats off to them for doing the kind of work uh, that they do. And I, we're seeing more and more uh, such people these days. Yes, I agree. I think the that answer that you give is very similar to the one I typically give when I'm asked this question as well, just because mm, okay. there are so many amazing innovations and so many people around the world who are actually <sighs> actively doing something about yeah, the challenges yes. that we're seeing in, in the environment. And it's it's very inspirational. And to point out just one seems very unfair because mm -hmm. there's just so many. And and yes. there's there are so many opportunities that we have. And you know, to focus just on you know reducing plastic means that we're avoiding talking about air pollution, for instance, or we're not talking about water pollution. And mm -hmm. and I think this is this is what personally gets me very motivated and, and I'm thrilled uh, to see on a daily basis is the number of people all over the world who are finding some challenge and actively doing something and, yeah, and looking exactly. for a unique innovation solution to it. Yeah. And um, I think, um, I think uh, the work that you're doing as well with, with pure skies is exactly this, you know, you uh, how, how you discovered this by starting out as a doctor and really seeing this consistent, issue and then through your research you discovered mm -hmm. an incredible solution which is 
I mean, it's very elegant. It's very easy. It doesn't really require um, any kind of major changes to a factory or a city. You just install right. a little box and it kind of just starts working and it gets smarter and smarter as um, as time goes on. Yeah. Um, we, have, we have just reading through a couple of um, comments here. Um, uh, Sagar says uh, to, to suggest reading the book called Limits to Growth by Donella Meadows. Um, oh, thank you, Sagar. Masterpiece and gets the root of the problem of sustainability. And great work, both of us. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, has a question. Um, in your point of view, how can we increase consumers' awareness and their willingness to pay for sustainable the question is specifically about sustainable food products. I think we should actually just broaden that out. You know, how can we increase consumers' willingness to pay for sustainable products in general? Do you yes. have any insights on that? Yes. You know, when I when I think of why does why does pollution happen in the world? I'm talking about a purely spiritual standpoint, coming from a country like India. Three main reasons come to mind. One is ignorance. The second is apathy, and the third is greed. Uh, mm -hmm. The cure for, for ignorance is education. The cure for apathy and greed is love. It's not policy. It's not rules and regulation. It's love. And if you can refocus your work on sustainability to education and love, you've taken care of all three of these root causes for pollution. Ignorance, apathy, and greed are taken care of just through these two simple approaches. That's how I would take it. That's what we do in David Griffith. We, you know, when I was working in the hospital, it was always about serving my patients. Now, as CEO of David Griffith, I tell everyone, we're here to serve our customers. And we do that with love. And that takes care of the apathy and the greed. And we educate them. Yes, I agree 100%. And then we were actually saying this before we, we started. I, education is probably the most important element from a um, mm -hmm. kind of a mainstream or um, I suppose bigger picture point of view at least that this is what I keep hearing consistently from mm -hmm. from people I speak to just like just like you just said and um, yeah it, it's really I think that's the biggest challenge for us is making sure that the that the masses are are educated the information is is true I, I think this is a, a big challenge for us as well as misinformation um, and mm -hmm. also Speaking on the point of love, I, I see a lot of fear being constantly projected about how everything is really, really bad, and you yeah, know, things are. Yes. And it's true that we have really massive challenges, but there are things that are being done, and we can all participate and and actually, uh, you know, do something about it. Even even if it's just um, to I means point, purchasing organic every now and again when you can or picking up right. some trash that you see on on the street these little actions make a big difference and i think the point that others may not always realize is that when you do it you actually may be affecting someone else who's watching and you don't even realize they're right. watching yeah yes yeah. so yeah i think that's a very good point um and just as we're approaching the top of the hour here or the um, at least in, in the UK, um, where can people learn more about David Gurth or if they want to you know, purchase some of the products or discuss with you uh, sure. how they can install Pure Skies? Sure. sure, they can just come to our website and uh, our team would be happy to discuss what would be appropriate for them. Um, we're very keen that we follow whatever uh, country specific laws and regulations are present. So do give us a few more months to finish that up. As I said, we're planning to launch into the US and the EU by the end of this year. We're already getting ready for the Middle East and South Asia, we're already in Chile and South America. So yeah, it's a big planet uh, that we've got a lot to cover. So please come, give us your feedback, give us your ideas. And, and we'd love to, I mean, we're all in this together. 100%. And, and for anyone watching, the website is davic-earth.com, and that's spelled D-E-V-I-C-Earth.com. So, um, Dr. Sola, thank you very much for your time. So we had um, Dr. Srikant Sola from Davic Earth joining us today to talk about how the Pure Skies technology is saving both people and the planet by reducing air pollution uh, all over the world, hopefully very soon. So. Uh, 
Dr. Sola, thank you very, very much. Uh, just one uh, one more quote or, or comment from Hiran Panchal, one man perfection can save the whole world. Hats off to you guys. <laughs> yes. I would add it's love. It starts with love, it ends with love. And if you have love, that will power things through. It's not technology, it's love. That's how it will work. I think that's a great way to, uh, to end that. And I, I think that's a beautiful, beautiful point. So Dr. Sola, thank you very much again for your time. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much.